So let me start off by introducing our esteemed panel. First, we have Dr. Oliver Brooks, who received his undergraduate degree in biology from Morehouse College in Atlanta, his medical degree from Howard University College of Medicine, and a residency in pediatrics from the Children's Hospital of Oakland, where he practiced for four years before accepting a position at Watts Health Corporation. Dr. Brooks is currently the chief medical officer and past chief of pediatric and adolescent medicine at Watts Healthcare Corporation in Los Angeles. Dr. Brooks is also the immediate past president of the National Medical Association and has held several leadership positions um, in that organization. Dr. Brooks has also received numerous honors and awards, including outstanding service to the community by the National Council of Negro Women, Long Beach, California, uh, was a wall of excellence for medicine awardee for the Long Beach um, 2016 Black History Month, and in 2019 was honored as one of the top Blacks in healthcare by blackdoctors.org. Thank you, Dr. Brooks, for joining us. Next is Dr. Deborah Dees, MD and MPH. She's the Vice Chancellor for Health Sciences uh, with Mark and Pam Rubin, uh, Deans of School of Medicine, uh, University of California, Riverside. Uh, Dr. Dees is the Vice Chancellor for Health Sciences and, and the Mark and Pam Rubin Dean for that school, Professor of Psychiatry at the University of California, Riverside. Under her leadership, the school has seen, has seen a tremendous growth in this medical education, biomedical sciences, and clinical enterprises program, helping it fulfill its mission to improve the availability of healthcare for people across the inland, inland Southern California. Since arriving in 2016, Dr. Dees has led efforts to increase the class size of our, our medical and biomedical sciences program, expand clinical affiliations, develop and expand the robust UCR uh, health clinical enterprise, and increased uh, National Institute of Health funding, as well as private giving. She has worked with UC leadership and state legislators to secure state funding for a new medical education building, as well as an ongoing uh, commitment to of 25 million of annual state funding to support the operational expenses of the school. Thank you, Dr. D, for, for joining us this morning. We also have Dr. Roberto Vargas, he is the Assistant Dean for Health Policy and Interprofessional Education within the College of Medicine and a Director of the Health Policy Pillar of the Urban Health Institute at Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science. Dr. Vargas is leading uh, university-wide efforts to uh, efforts in health policy analysis, health services research, and the educational and curricular um, content in these domains through course didactics, lectures, and hosting conferences open to external partners and community members. He, is also, he also supports efforts in action and advocacy consistent with the CDU's advantage and mission of promoting health equity and social justice. Dr. Varkas is a board, is board certified in internal medicine and adjunct natural scientist uh, at RAND Corporation and serves on the NIH All of Us Research Program Advisory Panel and the National Kidney Foundation's Health Equity Advisory Committee. He completed the fellowship in general internal medicine at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical uh, Center, Harvard University School of Medicine, and a master's of public health degree at the Harvard School of Public Health. He completed his residency and chief residency in, at Yale Primary Care Internal Medicine Residency Program, received his uh, medical degree from Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia, and undergraduate degree in history and sociology of science from the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you, Dr. Vargas, for being with us uh, this morning. We also have Lisa Odegi, uh, MPH, and she's the founder of Black Doctors List. We've had a chance to meet with Lisa and talk about the wonderful work she's doing. Um, she is a native of Los Angeles and has dedicated her career to improving community and cultural vibrancy. As a multi-hyphenate um, career woman, she has become a leader in directing public um, uh, health public policy, developing marketing strategies and community building through real estate. She is a solution driven professional who in response to her own experiences in pregnancy and childbirth, created black doctors lists to help reduce racial and ethnic disparities uh, for black Americans. And thank you Lisa for being with us. And then finally we have um, with us, Dr. Uh, Ihezadeh, 
Dr. E. Robertson, uh, he's a medical student and, uh, and one of our Elevating the Safety Net Scholars for uh, LA Care. Um, Dr. Uh, we're calling Doc already, he's at MS1, attending the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Uh, e. Hizeli e. um, seeks to earn his MD, MBA dual degree as a student, um, Doctor of Prime LA, a medical education program focused on developing leaders dedicated to uplifting um, underserved populations in healthcare. Prior to attending David Geffen, he received his bachelor's degree at the University of California, Berkeley, his master's at the University of John Hopkins. He was, uh, he has, or was during these formative years, became uh, definitely aware of the America history of inequitable healthcare. In response to this knowledge, he has resolved to become both an outstanding physician and a leader in healthcare administration to address the disparities that plague healthcare. Thank you to also to the American Medical Association for providing LA Care with this uh, screening opportunity of the film for the last three days. And I don't know if, if Mr. Backus has joined us yet. I am here. Good morning, sir. How are you? Would like to give us some words of greeting? <laughs> well, good morning, Dr. Kyle, and good morning to our panel. Uh, I've met Dr. Vargas and Dr. Brooks before, I haven't met the others, but it's a pleasure having you here. Um, you know, I, I, I know our, we all know why we're here. Um, LA Care is the largest Medi-Cal managed care plan uh, in California, um, is well aware of the lack of diversity in our pool of participating providers. This is particularly important because the people we care for in LA Care are largely people of color, and yet it is not reflected in the professionals they see. We all know, uh, the literature is uh, ripe with it, that if a patient sees a provider of the same race or ethnicity, they're likely to get better outcomes for a variety of reasons. Um, and we have been attempting to figure out what we can do about that. First, there is a lack of enough primary care doctors in those places where Medi-Cal uh, beneficiaries live, and those are healthcare deserts that are all over Los Angeles County. And um, the uh, added uh, disparity between the, the uh, racial content of the provider panel and the patients is, is stunning. So I think most of you may be aware of it, but if you're not, LA Care. Um, I went to the Board of Governors in uh, late in 2018 and said, I think we really need to focus our reserves, which we maintain for uh, emergencies. But if we could take 5% of our unassigned reserves each year for five years, we created a program uh, called Elevating the Safety Net, and the funding is $155 million. In that program, there are several, uh, there are five different components, but two I want to mention to this panel um, as food for thought, if you will. But um, we decided to fund uh, eight scholarships at medical school per year, um, four at Charles Drew and four at UCLA Geffen. Uh, we do refer to them, Dr. Kyle, as LA Care Scholars, and they get a little white coat, but says all that on it. And uh, what we said to the uh, schools was, look, you have been doing this for decades, so you can probably spot the first year student applying. This is going to be somebody that will come back and work in the safety net. So to date, we've done four years and we have 32 LA Care Scholars in school. The first cohort will graduate next May. And I'm happy to report that half of them are women, which is another disparity we have in some of our um, in some of our uh, participating providers. And all but two are of color, particular emphasis on um, Black and Latino students. Uh, we're very thrilled about this program because, um, as I've met the 32 LA Care Scholars, they all have an extraordinary story about how they got to even apply to medical school. And that's inspiring to hear. But when you talk to them about 
what's your motivation? Why are you pursuing this? Every single one of them is saying, because I had a, I had a role model in, when I was growing up, it was helpful to our community, or I want to come back to the community I came from to improve the health status of the people that are there. So we're building a pipeline. We hope that will um, we hope that will help ease this issue. We've also provided grants and medical uh, school debt reduction to clinics and practices here in Los Angeles who will recruit new primary care doctors into the safety net. And I'm pleased to report that we have 128 doctors who have been recruited through that program. And uh, 97 of those are, have applied for the medical school debt relief. We'll retire up to 180,000. So um, I mentioned that because I was hoping when we launched this program um, that others would follow us. Um, but I look over my shoulder and there ain't too many people behind us doing the things we're doing. So I hope I, I offer that as um, something for you to consider during your discussions that there are things existing entities can do to address this issue. And I hope we're an example of one of those. Thank you all very much for being here and back to you, Dr. Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Backus. Thank you very much for being with us and for your support of this important project to elevating the safety net here at, at LA Care. Uh, I want to welcome all of our panelists, as well as all of our, our uh, attendees to our, our program today. Um, let me just spend a few minutes to just explain the problem. Uh, a recent UCLA study found that the proportion of physicians who are Black in the U.S. has remained essentially unchanged since 1940. In 2018, about 13% of the U.S. population was Black, but only 5.4% of the physicians were black. Healthcare accounts for nearly 20% of the United States GDP and a significant portion of uh, that is driven by disparities in the system that lacks diverse positions. Uh, what if we had a medical workforce that actually reflected the patient population? How would that change the lives of people uh, across this country? You've already heard a lot about what LA Care is doing, but we, we definitely want to have a call to action. Um, that allows us to hopefully get other health plans and other hospitals and other entities to begin investing in um, black men in, in medicine. So a brief synopsis of the film, I think you've all had a chance to see the film. Uh, I hope you were as touched by it as, as I was. It was produced by uh, Dr. Dale Bokoradutu. Uh, he's uh, formed and founded Black Men in White Coats. It documents in this film um, medical doctors' ex uh, exploration of why only 2% of America's doctors are Black at this time and what that means to uh, society in general. Less Black men applied to medical school in 2014 than in 1978. And, and Black men have the lowest life expectancy in the United States. With only 2% of African Americans uh, who represent 2% uh, of all American doctors being Black, this comes as no surprise as to our lower life expectancy. Uh, the documentary dissects the system and systemic barriers that prevent Black men from becoming medical doctors and the consequences on society at large. So it's time to end this crisis, and I think that's what the, this film is about. And that's going to be what our discussion is going to be about uh, this morning. So thank you, panelists. I'm going to open it up with some questions, and uh, we're going to give you the opportunity to respond as you see fit. Uh, first of all, regarding Dr. Bokoradudu's um, asking this question, he says, are they functioning? Speak about medical schools. He says, are they functioning as stewards of the country's doctors or more like businesses? Because those are going to lead to two different outcomes. What do you think? about this question. What do you think he meant by this question of medical schools functioning either as stewards of the country's doctors or uh, businesses? And maybe we'll talk to our three medical school um, uh, panelists, um, Dr. Dees, uh, and maybe Dr. Vargas, if you'd like to maybe address that question first. 
So when we put, when we think about the question by the medical school steward for the country's doctors are more like businesses. I think that um, question has um, multiple layers. Uh, medical schools are stewards for the country's doctors, and that's the mission of um, most medical schools to train physicians. At the same time, medical schools have um, business aspects. And when I say that, is that we all know no money, no mission. So we can't divorce um, revenues and funding from medical school. If we're going to train a physician um, population, there has to be funds to do it. Now, when we look at the stewards of for the country's doctors, I think we may want to extend that and ask the question, are the medical schools stewards for all of the country doctors? And when I say that, I'm talking about broadening this arena so that we can work towards bringing our training physicians who reflect America, who reflect the population of America. And as you um, stated, Dr. Heil, African Americans comprise 13% of the country, about 6% of the nation's physicians. So if you look at that statistic, then the medical schools are not doing their jobs. However, I feel that as a dean of a medical school, we should be doing our job. And I can say at the University of California, Riverside, we have the unique mission of training a diverse physician workforce. Not many medical schools have that as their mission, the word a diverse physician workforce. And I can tell you that since I arrived in 2016, we are living up to that mission. When I arrived, we had um, only one African American male in the class to graduate soon, and very few Latinx. Last year, we admitted 50% of our class underrepresented in medicine, mostly Latinx, about 13% African Americans. And in that class, we had five African American males. So we can become and be stewards for the country's doctor. And I challenge my colleagues as deans of other medical schools to join forces so that we can solve this dire crisis of lack of black males in medicine. Thank you, thank you. That's Dr. perfect. Would you Dr. like to jump in? Oh. And, and then I'll come right to you, Lisa. Oh, okay, sure. Great. Thank you. All right, I, I got your hand. I see you. I got you. Great. No, no thank you. And thank you, Dr. Dees. You know, it's, it's encouraging, you know, to hear the transition that you've been able to put in place at UC Riverside. You know, here at CDU, uh, you know, we've had you know, a 50 year history of uh, really creating physicians in communities of color and physicians of color and also have a mission statement that explicitly uh, you know, states that we want to train diverse physician leaders. Uh, and so it's, it's great to hear you know, that this is you know, being spread uh, more broadly. And I, and I think that uh, we need to encourage our other schools to do this uh, because it is the right thing to do. I think moral right uh, has its place 
uh, and we and we need to promote that. I think the question of the business of medicine is one that uh, I feel often deters people from doing what we know we should be doing uh, in the realm of increasing diversity and serving under-resourced communities. And, and that's why I think this elevating the safety net uh, you know, uh, scholarship uh, and, and the funds that are being put towards it uh, is one example. You know, as we pr prepare to expand our MD program at CDU uh, from 28 to, to 88 students a year, uh, the ability to train physicians uh, in a setting in which they have uh, providers, uh, teachers and faculty of color, where they have a history of serving the community of color like Charles Drew University does, uh, I think is is one way of doing that. Um, we have a very strong track record of our physicians going back to communities of color. Uh, because we have been around uh, for so long, we uh, have created many of the uh, minority physicians that are practicing uh, here uh, on the West Coast as the only historically black graduate medical education institution uh, west of the Mississippi. Uh, and so it, it makes good business sense for folks like uh, the LA Cares and, and others who want to create providers that are going to take care of their patients to do some of these offsets because some of the deterrence of some of the, you know, the highly qualified black male students to go into medicine uh, can be that they don't have the financial resources or that, you know, or that medical school may not be a good return on their educational investment. So scholarships matter. I think that when we look at, uh, you know, issues like, you know, where people are practicing and having to deal with, you know, being in training settings where you don't have physicians who share your values, having, you know, programs that pay physicians back uh, on their loans to practice in under-resourced settings uh, allow you to train physicians, uh, you know, in these environments with physicians who um, also share those values and those histories. So I, I believe that there are ways to deal with the business model. Um, I do believe that at the leadership level, uh, you know, work that Dr. Deese has done is really encouraging. And we have to, you know, really set the example and be a leading edge to let people know that diversity is important. Uh, it matters uh, and that it doesn't have to come at a financial uh, cost. Great. It's, it's good to have these uh, academic leaders uh, on the panel to give us their perspective. Lisa, I, I saw you just bubbling over with something you wanted to say. Oh, yes, I was just going to um, also agree both with Dr. Dees and Dr. Vargas um, based on the question about um, the admissions panels functioning and, you know, medical schools functioning as stewards of our country's doctors. I feel like both of you are saying, and I was going to just add that I, I'm appreciative of what you're doing, um, is that it sounds like the a key factor in increasing enrollment is going to be us at every step of the way. Like they talked about in the documentary about gatekeepers and the fact that our, you know, forget just black people in general, but our black male medical students have gatekeepers that are either preventing them or helping them along the way in their path of becoming doctors. And so it sounds like a key factor in, you know, just talking about the increase of black student enrollment, Dr. Dees, that you've seen, it seems like a part of that is contributed to the fact that more black leadership is sitting at the table and sitting in the admissions committees. Um, because if we don't have us advocating for us, you know, those numbers aren't going to change either, you know, putting the impetus on the systems to just change without having us in those roles is not going to, it's not going to move the needle fast enough. Um, so it, it sounds like also having us in those rooms and being part of those admissions committees is, is really vital um, to the success of, of the mission. Excellent. For, for Dr. Robinson and for Dr. Brooks, um, in the movie, the line was repeated several times, to be it, you got to see it. To be it, you got to see it. Um, how, how, did that, how did that strike you? And do you think there's real truth to that, to that statement? Yeah, I, I will speak first in one brief statement on what you said before about the medical schools. We need to mandate them having a certain number of African Americans coming through, period, because people often respond only when they're made to respond. So I like everything that was said, but I believe that the AAMC has to say you need to have this particular uh, benchmark number, period. Uh, as it relates to you got to see it to be it, I think that there's some truth to that. 
I think that, however, a lot of young black men and and women, there there is already the vision and the image of a black doctor. A lot of them have seen black doctors. I think it almost is more not see black doctors because, as we all know, the problem is not medical school. The problem starts with the pipeline from you know infancy almost. So what they need to see is black, successful people. I mean, if they saw a successful black lawyer or a businessman, that translates to me into being a successful black doctor. Um, So I think that the image and the direct exposure, so actually forget the image, but living with someone, knowing someone, being around someone that is inherently successful, that there is a focus on intellect as opposed to uh, money or fame. Mm-hmm. I do believe that that makes a big difference. And when, as I look back on myself, I mean, both my parents had master's degrees, right? But I ended up getting into medicine, number one, once I wanted to, but I was exposed in high school. I was in a program where I was at University of Pennsylvania as, as a high school. Who was it? My boy uh, went to Jeff and Penn. So, you know, I'm, I'm from Philly, so good for you, Roberto. But I mean, I was in that type of program. The name was American Foundation for Negro Affairs. So you think that must have been bad. In the 70s, we <laughs> call something that. But we were in this program, and it shepherded us to understand and have direct exposure to academic, academics, academia. So, yeah, I think that there, that is very important. That, but the general concept of exposure, uh, as opposed to specifically Black doctors. All right. But Robertson, your thoughts? Uh, I, I completely agree with the sentiment. I think it's very important that you actually see um, role models who are black, um, who are actually doctors. And I think that was a pivotal part of my experience to get in here. Um, I was blessed enough to shadow over five uh, black orthopedic surgeons. Um, and that orthopedic surgery is the least, uh, one of the least diversified professions in medicine. I believe it's like something about like north of 95% are white uh, males. Um, so to be able to see that was just incredible. Um, and I think it's one of those things where the reality is as you aspire for higher professions in medicine, you're gonna become more segregated. You're, you're gonna see less and less of people who look like you um, as you just go through higher education period. Um, so to be able to see those things, to be able to see those reminders, to be able to talk to those people, um, it's definitely like, a, it's grounding, I would say, uh, during that time, you know, being able to talk to those um, mentors of mine really, um, it was really illuminating in the sense that, you know, nobody's going to be able to keep it as real with you as those people who are already like experiencing it. You're not going to get those inside uh, tidbits from people who don't be or who don't like reflect your experience. Um, so I think it's very important to actually see those people, to be able to talk to those people, to be able to have candid conversations, um, to be able to get real guidance um, and to hear it from perspective that aligns with you and that aligns with your experience. Um, I think it's invaluable, honestly. Um, and I would go back a step further and, and even say that, you know, not seeing those things, I don't think that I would have the same level of success that I have now um, just because it's different from the outside looking in, you know, to be able to get that inside view, to get that inside perspective and to be able to understand and to hear that, you know, the things that you deal with now are still things that you're going to deal with in medicine. You know, you know, putting on a white coat doesn't automatically garner you this um, shield from racism. It doesn't garner you this shield from discrimination. Um, if anything, it just uh, enhances you and puts you under a further burden in representation. But um, I, I just think it's it, it's it's invaluable in, in to be able to hear it from that experience, but also just to be able to see it like this is very beneficial um, to know that it's possible. When you see somebody else already did it, I think it just makes it that much easier. And I'm somebody that's strongly self-driven, but still being able to see five different black orthopedic surgeons, I was like, you know, if I seen five of them, why can I be the six? You know what I mean? It, just, <laughs> right. it made it that easy. Very good. Very good. Dr. Deesa, throw your hand in. Lisa, I see you. Yes, I'd just like to um, add to that. I agree with what um, both of the physicians stated. I do believe to um, be it, you should see it. And I really feel that Proximity is important and becoming proximal to what uh, Dr. Brooks described as excellence 
are becoming proximal to a physician really changes for the aspiring uh, physician what the possibilities are. And when I think about pathways of pipeline programs, that's why those programs are important, not just to um, give information about healthcare profession, but to have physicians like me out there. For instance, in my case, growing up in a rural community on a farm, my parents farmers, they were not college educated, and I'm a first generation college student. When I'm out in the community and students learn that I'm a first generation, my parents didn't go to college, and I'm also a dean of a medical school and a physician, they, their eyes um, brighten and they feel, wow, you can do that. I can do that too. And in our medical school, part of our mission process, we look for first generation college students. And we use that in our holistic process of our admission. And consequently, about 35% of our medical school class are students who are first generation students. Now, when those students see me as a first generation and I could be a physician and become a dean, they know when I walk through the corridors and I sit outside with my students for lunch, and they tell me that their families are migrant workers. And I talk about my parents who are long gone, that they were farmers. They could connect to that. And yes. they could have a vision of what they can be and what they can do. And to know that because of my background, my dedication to service and serving the underserved is real. That's what we talk about and that's what they want to do. So I think um, seeing it, to be it, is very important. All right, all right. Lisa, as a healthcare professional yourself, what do you think about this conversation so far? Then I'll come to Dr. Vargas. Sure, absolutely. So, you know, having like I, you know, Dr. Kyle mentioned in my in my bio, um, I've worked in uh, the community for a number of years, and um, my particular focus is working with youth. And one of the things that I've learned, and I will say, any strategy, any strategy that we come up with has to focus on youth driven approaches. Um, because oftentimes as adults, of course, we're going to come up with what we think is the best way to impact and the best way to change mindsets. But you got to get in the mind of a child to know how to, you know, work with them, right? And so one of the things that I know is so important in this seeing it to be it uh, conversation is very touchable um, mentors and meaningful mentorship. So it's not just, you know, we have more Black actors, playing doctors on TV or we have more, you know, people to see on social media or whatever. It's it's the touchable aspect of it, because from what my experience is, we're talking about black children, right? Almost 70 percent of black children come from single parent households. So that alone is a whole conversation if we just talk about the income implications. Right. So I was telling Dr. Kyle watching this documentary started making me as a public health researcher, like I'm thinking about all the different ways that we can take this conversation. And one of them really has to do with the, the impact of income and how that alone, if you change the, the income level and how that literally, that ticks off all the boxes when you're talking about the barriers to a black man's success. So let so just talking about that alone. So if you're talking about the fact that they're coming from single parent households and what that does, they need male mentors that are not just going to 
be visible for a time. This has to be very targeted, very direct, and very consistent and durable mentorship that has to persist from the time that you start with them, really all the way through their career. They need because like we talked about before with the gatekeepers, you know, there are going to be barriers all along their path. And so having a mentor that is going to be durable and work with this student and stay with them. And then beyond just, you know, giving them the image of what success looks like, um, you know, because that's a big part of the mission of Black men and white coats, which is showing the lifestyle. We need to show them, you know, we're not just doctors. I might be a doctor and an athlete. I might be a doctor and a singer. I might be a doctor and an entrepreneur. So there are so there doctors are multifaceted people. And I think sometimes for our students, they don't see that you can be anything else. So when you tell them, oh, well, if I go to be a doctor, then I can't play basketball anymore. Or, you know, if I'm going to go, you know, be a medical professional, then I can't do X, Y, and Z, you know, more of the extracurriculars, it loses their interest. But I really like that in the documentary, there was a doctor that said his mother told him be great at everything if you want to play basketball be great at that you want to be a doctor be great at that too you want to play piano be great at that too literally just be great whatever you decide to do whatever your passion is be great at it um, but I think again it's so important to have that physical connection and translate it to jobs I think the biggest thing is if you're going to help a black male student give them a job whether he's just typing some documents for you or whatever give them a job because that's that is going to stop them from going going down the paths that we know will take them in the opposite direction of a successful trajectory. So give them a job. You know, Dr. Okoradudu, uh, who produced this film, remember him talking about, you know, the need to have doctors who are cool and to show that doctors can be cool. And, and you saw him and his partner, um, another physician, going to the barbershop and they had swagger when they were walking from their car to the barbershop because they, they, were, they were cool. Uh, Dr. Parker, I want to ask you a, a question. I know you wanted to respond, but I want you also to also respond to another question that sure. Lisa just raised. And it also was, came up in the movie, standardized testing and MCATs. And there was a relationship between family income and scores on the MCAT. In other words, the higher your family income, the higher your MCAT scores. How, and so what Lisa's talking about in terms of economic development also sounds like it also becomes a competitive advantage for us to raise the standard of our of our of our livelihoods so that our kids can do better in in, in their future. What's your thought about that? Yeah, so I, I'm going to get to that, uh, and because <clears throat> that's an important part, I just want to circle back very quickly. Uh, just once again, in support of pipeline programs, it, it was great to hear Dr. Brooks talk about that. Um, I too was the beneficiary of a pipeline program. New York City uh, in high school, we had summer programs that taught us. Uh, science and, and, and science research skills, that got me on the right trajectory. That opened my eyes. The first time I saw a black doctor was one who came to talk to us during that summer program and let us know what the roadmap was and said, here are the steps you take to become a doctor. And not having physicians in the family, knowing that there were so many years of school, but that here's what could be done. There was somebody doing it, made a difference. Another pipeline type program was uh, in the summer of my uh, sophomore year in college. Uh, UVA had a program similar to, uh, I think, what Dr. Brooks had, where they brought uh, Black college students together uh, to, to do uh, some preparation in terms of skills, but also research exposure, mentorship to become physicians. It, it not only helped me to better prepare to get into medical school, but I spent a summer around, uh, you know, probably about 100 other Black students who were on that same trajectory. Many of us would have gone there anyway. But we were stronger coming out of there. You know, many of those guys are my best friends to this day. So although we scattered and we went to different schools and different places afterwards, we had relationships with people that we could call up when we were in some of these ivory towers alone, uh, that we had colleagues, you know, uh, at other places that we could reach out to who were going through the same thing. So, yeah. so these things yeah. matter. So we really have to make sure that we support these types of pipeline programs. You know, every, uh, you know, academic medical center should be sponsoring them. CDU has had a K through 12 pipeline program, Science Summer Academy, Science, Saturday Science Academy for over 30 years. Uh, you know, we actually have students and residents right now who are in our programs in South LA uh, with yeah. kids. Uh, and so yeah. I just want to make another plug for the importance of pipeline programs at, at, at many levels. Uh, this aspect of the standardized testing one, I think was really great for them to bring that up and to highlight you know, this economic disparity. I think, you know, what you're seeing at, at many centers where you're seeing parents not just, you know, pay for students, 
to, to get these courses to get better scores, but actually paying for the students to get into school, which is another story in of itself. That's a different story. It's an economic <laughs> disparity, okay, yeah. that's driven by these standardized tests that gives, uh, you know, a false sense of, of meritocracy uh, in using these scores. I think holistic evaluations of students is one way to combat that. Okay, so scores matter. Okay, yes, but you if you have cutoffs that don't allow you to even look at qualified candidates who may have had other challenges, um, you know, that that's part of what needs to be uh, considered. Uh, there are other strengths that are incredibly important that you'll never see in a standardized test. So if you took the top standardized test scores, you'd have a bunch of folks in there that'd be horrible doctors. So you have to really have a holistic approach to this. And it takes time and resources. The schools have to invest. We do this. We look at everything. That, you know, having cutoffs that allow you to look at candidates more carefully uh, matter. Uh, and then when you get folks in, you know, you make sure that you support them and give them the resources that are needed uh, so that at, by the time everybody gets through, we all have qualified folks coming through. So there's a lot of different things, holistic evaluations, support of folks uh, broadly while they're in uh, these programs are two of the things that I would point to right off the bat. Great. Uh, just before I go to Dr. Robinson, I want to give you folks a question to ponder while Dr. Robinson speaks. It came up in, in the chat. And the question really um, is, are there enough pipeline programs to address the vast gaps of scale? And if not, what can be done to increase these levels? In other words, this is a bigger problem than a single pipeline program. What do we what do we need to do more than what we're doing now? Every academic Yeah. Dr. <laughs> so, Robinson, you, you had something you wanted to add. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, I think uh, the economic disparity is like underrated. Um, I definitely think like, especially in my experience to get into med school, um, there's just so many things that require money in order for you to have opportunities. Uh, there's so many times where I wish I had enough money to simply just pay for a tutor, um, to simply pay for a program that I was really interested in that was going to behoove me in one way or another. Um, I just think like along the ways, like there's just even little things like that. Like it's not even just the classes, but honestly, just I want to get better at this and it costs money to go get a tutor. It costs money to do this. It costs money to do a lot of things that a lot of people don't even think about. Um, and so I think like in my time, especially as an undergrad, um, there were so many opportunities I missed out on just simply because I didn't have the funding necessary um, to take part in those things. And there's only so much you could do on your own. I think I'm a huge fan of mentorship. I'm a huge fan of being able to ask somebody else. I love getting tutored. Um, it's one of my favorite ways to learn. Um, so I just think like those, and it's, when you don't have enough money, it's discouraging as well. Like it makes you feel like you can't compete in a lot of ways, especially when your goals, so for me as a person, I went to a PW, I went to UC Berkeley. So, I mean, all my peers, a lot of my peers that I was competing with, you know what I mean? Uh, had those funds, had those resources and are like casually talking about them as if, you know, it's like a, a secondhand thing. And I'm sitting there like lost and I can't keep up with that. So, I mean, that in itself, it, it, it just adds to that idea of like, I have to work 10 times harder in order to keep up with those people. And that in itself is so discouraging. It's not fair for everybody to have to go through something that daunting. I mean, I honestly want to make it easier for people who are to, or to who are to proceed me. I don't want anybody to have to go through the things that I had to go through in order to keep up with my peers. Um, but secondly, I would speak to the fact that like being a holistic applicant is that that's the that's right now. I think that's the strongest um, way to combat that. I, I, uh, UCLA two years ago, I believe I could do wrong fact checking on it. I think like two or three years ago, they actually raised their cutoff score to 512. I felt well short of that. Um, I felt well short of that. Uh, I'm not <laughs> I'm, I don't feel embarrassed about my score. I got a 505. I was practice scoring around 512. Um, and I, I still I still couldn't get in. I, I spent years uh, practicing for the MCAT. I spent years uh, mastering that material. If you ask me about that material, I could casually speak about it. But testing in itself was a different uh, is, is a different skill. It's a skill set to be good at testing. That is actually a skill. It's not that you are not smart, you're not worthy, you're not working as hard as anybody. No, it's actually just a skill. I know people who know half as much as me and can still do better on the test than me because they have a better test taking skills. So I think that's a thing um, that, that needs to be addressed as well. And I, I definitely goes with the economic disparity, but I would say like to combat it all, you definitely need to be a holistic applicant. Um, I was, yeah. I'm still to this day shocked um, that I got accepted by UCLA's uh, main camp. So UCLA has three different programs. It's uh, Charles Drew. Um, then you have the Prime LA program, which I'm in. And then you actually have UCLA uh, DGSOM. And, uh, DGSOM is, 
I, I would say has the most strict uh, requirements in order to get in. One of them being that five show cutoff. They were the first ones to accept me. And I, I, I strongly believe that's because I had a strong holistic application that shined through. Um, so I, I'm grateful because I know on the other side of that, I know there was planet list that shared uh, that share my my complexion, that that share my mindset, that share my experiences, um, that we're definitely able to highlight those things. But I also feel like even in my interviews and things like that, my my personality, my experiences stood out. And so I tell people all the time, don't be discouraged by a number. Don't be discouraged by a grade. You're not defined by that. Um, my my journey to be here looks nothing like I thought it was when I was 18. If you asked me when I was 18, I thought I was going to go straight through. I was going to be in med school by 22. I'm now 26 doing my first year and all those years in between that that I spent gathering experiences, developing myself as a person are what allowed me to get past those gates. So I definitely like there's other ways around it. I, I definitely don't yeah. want anybody to be discouraged or define themselves by their scores or their grades. There's so many ways to show how valuable you are past those numbers. And I will even say that you will separate yourself by focusing on those experiences as well. Very much. I, I, I see it in, in when I go to my classroom that there's nobody like me. There's nobody who can, who can speak the way I can speak. There's nobody who has the presence I have. There's nobody who has the word with all the experiences that I have. So don't like discredit those things. Those things make you just as strong as an applicant as well. All right, great. Dr. D, so I saw your hand. Did I think I saw your hand again, Lisa? Did I see your hand? Okay, yes, um, I just wanted to reiterate the holistic attention um, process. And as, um, let's see his name, Hizela Izike, um, as he stated, uh, we're just killing that man's name. We're just killing that man's name. <laughs> I'll get it right. And I want you to help me to get it right because it's Try important it. to say it correctly. That's right. Would you say your first name? Zelly. Zelly. Okay. Ehe Zelly. Yeah. Ehe Zelly. Yeah, I got it. Ehe Zelly. As Ehe Zelly stated, the MCAT is just one aspect and it's just the score and some medical schools will use it to screen students out i'm a proponent that we should not do that we shouldn't screen students out with a score but rather look at the students in a holistic way and some of the things that we look at include distance travel for instance, some students, as um, Ehezele stated, that they, some of these things came to them matter-of-factly. Well, they didn't travel a far distance, but he did. And so he would get extra um, recognition for how far he's traveled. Coming from a disadvantaged background, or uh, uh, educationally deprived background, meaning that you attended a school that didn't have the educational resources um, based on federal government requirements. First generation uh, in your family is the first generation college student. Overcoming some type of adversity and able to continue to make it. Those are all things that should be and may be considered in this um, holistic admissions process. But the one thing that um, he also said that I would caution us when you talked about the different programs that a school has, I really don't feel that schools should separate these programs because you mentioned that one particular program is more stringent. And the thought of you think having that that is more stringent, unconsciously, it states that you may perceive that students in that group may have something better than you. And I'm a firm believer that you think about the playing field being more level. If you got into medical school, look around the room and you all got into medical school. So no one's better than you. And therefore, when it's time for you to apply for residency training program, don't think that the student who got into a different program at UCLA will do better than you. You're all at the um, same level. 
And I think those are things that are really important. One other thing that I wanted to say is that we, if we have partnership with the community, medical schools and community, because someone in the chat said there's not enough pipeline program. For instance, at UCR School of Medicine, we have pipeline programs from kindergarten all the way to the practice of medicine. And I say the practice of medicine because our job is not just to train this diverse physician workforce, but we want them to go to residency programs and become physicians, primary care and specialists because we don't have enough Blacks in either. And we want them to come back to serve in the community. So that pipeline is a long pipeline and we want them um, here. But what we did, we partnered with the school district in both Riverside County as well as San Bernardino County. They didn't have enough to do it alone. We didn't have enough to expand further. And through our partnership, we were able to expand our pipeline programs to students in both counties. So those kind of partnerships are really important. So let, let me raise another question for the group, um, just to keep your mind uh, focused. In the movie, uh, a, a statement was made looking at what happens in terms of uh, how we, how we motivate students. It said, the soft bigotry of low expectation. The soft bigotry of low expectation. What we perceive, I think you're touching on this, Dr. B, what, what we believe we can accomplish determines what we accomplish. And if we have low expectation for ourselves, but let's talk about the flip side of that coin from elementary school right on up through medical school. Black students and especially black men face institutions that don't expect much of them. There is, they, they, the expectation of their teachers and their professors is low. And so that, that tends to be a formula that drives or works against excellence, works against self-confidence because no one expects them to do much. Have you? Have you experienced that in, in, in your either in your academic lives or in your in your professional lives as panelists today? And can you talk about what do we do to reverse that in our neighborhoods in our community? Lisa? Yes, I have a couple thoughts on that. Um, the first one is, um, like you said, the, the, the talk about expectations. So they talked about this in the documentary and for those on the panel that uh, did not get to watch the documentary, um, you know, the obstacles that black students face, they exist well before they even hit medical school. So you're talking as soon as they start school. So they talked about how the, the mindset of a young student from the time they are in first grade to third grade, First grade, you're talking a six-year-old. So you're saying that the mindset that a six-year-old has about themselves is already changing by the time they reach third grade. That means that, you know, the system that they be, are being placed in is not designed um, to help them succeed whatsoever. And then when you're talking about, like we said, about the, the household dynamic, you know, single parent households or households that don't have a strong uh, uh, figure to guide them towards success. All of these things are shaping the environment and shaping the mindset of our young black students. And um, personally, when we're talking, you know, I go back to what Dr. Vargas said about the importance of the pipeline programs. If we're going to shift mindset, there has to be uh, touch points around the child's entire experience that is going to influence and help them elevate their mindset. Um, and, you know, Dr. Dees, you talked about, you know, your partnership with Riverside and, and what worked. And I truly do believe that there are there are programs in the community that are they are designed to help black men succeed. But unfortunately, they are not. Um, 
they're not supported enough and they're not really being run by people who have the skills to do so. So when you're talking about reaching back, I really do feel like the reach back has to be in elevating the community programs that already exist and that are already working with these students. So um, when I had uh, worked with the LA County Department of Public Health. We did a program that provided training and technical assistance to organizations in South LA specifically that were addressing violence. Because as we know, violence is a huge factor for determining whether a Black man just makes it out the hood, if he lives or dies, right? So we're talking about these programs who were started by former gang members, formerly incarcerated members of our society, and they have the greatest intentions, but they don't have the tools to build the programs. So there are so many programs out there. We're talking about the programs that exist. We should elevate the ones that are there. If we're reaching back, reach back and elevate those programs because these are already trusted people in the community that have the ability to touch these students and really touch their lives you know, just from proximity. Um, and, you know, those are areas that, you know, we should really think about. I, I Working in that and seeing how much technical assistance is needed just to elevate the adults in the community to help them help the other students. I mean, it's a lot of pressure to ask, you know, just our doctors to, to be the, the charge and to be the ones to lead this. We need all of us supporting and elevating this work um, in order to help elevate the mindset of our students. Um, I just, I, I really feel very strongly about the pipeline programs and um, I do believe that they work. I do believe that that is a key um, measure in how we can elevate the mindset of our of our black students and our black men specifically. And one thing I want to say is another reason that's so important and you're talking about mindset is social deprivation. Black men face social deprivation in a way that um, I it, it doesn't face anyone in this way. And what I mean by that is your social network. Having a mentor elevates your social network because now that mentor puts you in places um, that you've never imagined being. You don't know a lot of these environments and new environments exist unless you have someone to do that for you. So you take black male students who don't have connections how are they going to navigate? You know the phrase, it's not who you know, it's not what you know, but who you know. We know that knowing the right people is what will put you in better environments and put you in the right spaces and, and expose you to new things. And Black men don't have those strong networks. The social deprivation that a Black man faces is, I actually learned about it just over the last 10 years. My husband immigrated here. He's a Nigerian from the UK, immigrated here uh, to the United States to marry me. Um, but <laughs> um, you know, his experience here, it really, I, I got to say, it opened my eyes to the plight of the Black man because I saw him come here and try to make connections. And then you face this barrier of, you know, people just, oh, yeah, 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 of course, sure, 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 sure. And then nobody really making making the moves and nobody really trying to help you. But then, you know, he and I can be in the same place and people are giving me opportunity. They talked about it in the documentary that, you know, inherently Black women have benefited um, and moved forward much faster than Black men, um, pretty much because of the feminist movement. Feminism has allowed Black women to rise, and that is helping Black people, but it's leaving Black men behind because we're focused on elevating one part of the group of the population and not both. And so I'm seeing how Black men specifically need these strong mentors and need to be able to expand their networks in order to grow, in order to bring themselves out of these environments. All right. Dr. Brooks, as a former past president of the NMA, um, even the very existence of the NMA is a testament to structural racism in this country, which made the formation of the NMA impossible. When I was a resident at UCLA, um, in my scrubs, white lab coat on, stethoscope around my neck, badge hanging, um, I step on an elevator to make rounds one evening, and a white woman on the elevator clutches her purse when she sees me stepping on the elevator as if I was going to snatch her purse from her. Um, that same night, I'm on the I'm taking to an elevator to another floor. Three white nurses are about to step on the elevator when the doors open. They see I'm in there by myself with my in my scrubs, and they step back to say, we'll catch the next elevator. Okay. Racism. It, I mean, it's 
for people who may not know, is this is this still a problem in medicine today for black residents, black medical students? Are we still facing that in our hospitals and our health systems? What do you think? Yeah, uh, and thank you for asking that question. And I'll also go back to one thing that you said. We we accept mediocrity instead of expecting excellence. So that is something that we do need to address. I, that's really foundational, I think, to a lot of the discussion that we're having. I remember when I went to Morehouse, I had to learn Ebonics because I was castigated for speaking proper English. So you know, I, I can be like, what you say, man, what's going on? You know, and I, I learned it, uh, but it helped me to, to, you know, blend in and I was okay with it, but we need to expect excellence. Uh, yes, racism is still unfortunately alive and well. It's been around for you know four hundred years. It was in its a construct, uh, and it it is embedded in America. I mean, we look, we need to look at America separate and distinct from the rest of the world. It's in other places, but we had our own kind. The Nazis patterned the treatment of the Jews by the racism and slavery that they studied from the United States. So it's important to understand how how strong that is. And so, yes, it's still there. And it, it it's another barrier that you had to face that you did go through. So I think that part of when we talk to our young men, let them know that, you know, unfortunately, this is just part of it. So I think we need to give them the tools to address it. I mean, and it's 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 hard because, you know, I got so much to me. Other thing, I got to take care of these patients. I got to study. I got to, you know, call my girlfriend until I can't come over again because, you know, I'm still, I'm too tired. You got so many things in your life as a student, as a resident. It's just one more thing. So I think that when we address the issue of uh, black men and white coats and getting more black men um, as physicians, we need to just be very clear that this is present. Uh, let them give them that self confidence, like you should. Put your shoulders up, you know. Yeah, I yeah. am a doctor. I am a resident. I am a medical student, and I am proud to be one. And I think some of that comes. Some of that will come from. So let's say the NMA. So we're working hard to get more black doctors, but to give like to speak amongst each other. There are enough of you in that particular school. Um, uh, Roberta went to uh, Jeff. I don't know how many blacks were at Jeff, but um, hopefully they got together and sp- spoke amongst each other to say, this is what we're facing and we need to just, you know, s- struggle, survive, grow and prosper. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll just uh, a- add to that. And so point of information for you, Dr. Brooks, at that time, uh, there were three of us out of a class of 250. Uh, uh, that that was 1991, uh, wow. but um, I think that um, you know that this aspect uh, of you know you know uh, as we look at uh, how we get this message out and change the perception, there was something that stuck with me uh, from the documentary that, that talked about making the black male physician relevant to the culture, mm. um, and I think that 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 stuck with me a lot. I thought about that a lot about how you know what we value as a people uh, and as a culture uh, and and, what, and who we laud in our society and 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 I do believe that we as black physicians and black male physicians in particular uh, I feel respected when I when I'm in those circles and I'm in those spaces but you know more than respect you know can we make that an expectation can can excellence in education and achievement uh, be equated with the excellence that we expect people to have in sports and entertainment um, you know, and, and can we have that dialogue to say there, are, you know, those are the expectations. Uh, some of these things are cross cutting. I think the things that we that we heard in the in the in the film about discipline and the value of discipline. I mean, Shane Battier's comments about you can learn discipline through athletics and through other things that will lend itself to uh, a, your ability to do well in education. Um, right. But I also think that there's a more explicit conversation that we can begin to have. Uh, about our expectation of our youth uh, and expecting education and academic excellence uh, and driving and rewarding that. Rewarding that at the same level that we reward uh, people who are great uh, in terms of skills of, of rhyming uh, and, and athletics. Uh, so, so there are some, some things that we can do as a culture. 
Uh, and, and I think that that's an internal conversation that we need to begin to have. All right. Yes, Ellie, I saw your hand and I see Dr. D. I want to add, um, I think it's very important to emphasize like, authenticity. I think it's very important to like, as you move into these spaces to still be yourself. Um, and I got like two vivid examples on my face right now, like my nose piercing and my, uh, and my piercing right here and there. Like, I don't, I, I don't like be less of myself anywhere I go. And I know that's hard for everybody to do. I don't ask that of everybody. Uh, I think like, but more so I, I do ask that you be yourself. I think where uh, I too often, you know, people look at whenever you have to, whenever you look at a medical professional, if they're separating it from, well, that doesn't necessarily like represent blackness or you need to be this, or you need to uh, capitulate to these type of standards in order to walk into these realms. And I'm like, yo, you don't have to take, you don't have to let go of any of who you are in order to move forward. Like those are the things that define you and who you are. Um, so I just like really want to speak to like people like being authentically yourself, whatever that looks like, whatever blackness looks like to you, be that. Um, and I think that's very important for black men to hear because a lot of them have this, this like this split. There's a, they always feel like there's something that they have a split. You know, whenever you're uh, to speak to Bruce, Dr. Bruce point, like, uh, not expecting ex excellence, right? An idea that it's like speaking proper. Like, what does that even mean? That means absolutely nothing. So you're letting somebody else perpetuate that on you. And then you're sitting there and you're, and you're enforcing it. So it's like those ideas, dispelling these notions that you can't be all of this. You can be all this wrapped up. You can speak of honest and still speak proper. It's called code switching. We do that daily. Like, we are the masters of it. So it's like an idea that you can be all of this. You don't have to be defined. You don't have to let go of anything. Um, I happily walk down, you know, my rounds with my do-rag sometimes. I like to keep my braids pretty. You know what I mean? So it's the idea of like, you don't have to let go of any of those things. And when people try to challenge you on those things, people try to challenge you on these things daily. Enlighten them. Like, feel free to enlighten them and to show them. But also just be aware. You know what I mean? Those are the things that you are. You definitely have a burden of representation. But at the same time, I think you're doing yourself a disservice and doing a disservice to the people that you are trying to uplift. Whenever you are leaving those types, when you're leaving whatever defines your blackness at home and when you're separating those spaces. Um, so I just think it's very important to be authentic as possible and to stick to who you truly are um, because you're opening doors, uh, whether you know it or not. And you're pushing the lever a little bit further each and every time that you are um, standing up for who you are and what you believe and whatever blackness is to you. I mean, it's all encompassing, um, honestly. Okay. So I just wanted to add that to what Dr. Brooks had to say earlier. So is, is Elliot talking about do-rags. Dr. Brooks and I remember wearing stocking caps. That's a whole different story. We wouldn't go. We wouldn't Get go. those waves in. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. D's, Dr. D's. Yes, just springboarding on the excellence and the expectation. I really feel that if we link this to pipeline programs and others, it comes early, much early, much earlier than pipeline programs. And will we? need to do is to really teach us children about their nobility, that nobility of mind, character, of excellence. And we need to arm them that with the um, thoughts and the feelings of high levels of confidence so that when they go out and someone is challenging them or trying to put them in a box, they let the parents know. But what we do, many of us, we prepare our students to our children to encounter racism and we teach them how what it looks like and what it sounds like, what it feels like, and what might happen. I think we also have to teach them about what it is to feel and to be noble and what it feels like when someone tries to denigrate you and take away that nobility. And that could come from teachers with low expectations. And um, unfortunately, it doesn't necessarily always come from teachers of the white race, but you have also teachers of color who have low expectation for some black males. And I think that our community organizations, with our medical schools, we can work together with these teachers too to hold them accountable and to have higher expectations of our students as well. Thank you. 
Before we open it up to questions from our audience, I want to introduce William Alamo to you. William is working with our uh, safety net uh, program, elevating the safety net. William, tell us what's on your heart. Good, uh, good morning, everyone, and I apologize for being late. I was invited to attend another workforce uh, meeting, and uh, what I can start with is um, really just sharing my experience and watching the film last night. Um, I had to put the kids uh, to, to sleep uh, before I actually had the opportunity to sit down and really enjoy uh, the content that was produced uh, in partnership with uh, the providers and the community that was invited to, to be part of the experience. And so... I um where I felt the most energy really and in, in the um in the in the the the, uh, the film was in seeing the the conference the preparation for that conference that was hosted uh, for the youth and the families that, that they you know that they really began to you know see and and really witness what um, the uh, provider community looks like and what opportunities are available for uh, the African American youth uh, that that would be you know, interested in pursuing those careers and so. Uh, it, it was it was amazing. I, I think it's been so long that we've been confined into you know the smaller spaces, smaller uh, settings. That I think that type of energy is really missing uh, from um, you know from, from what we really need in, in terms of inspiring the youth to pursue those careers. So, uh, for today's meeting, uh, I'm going to provide a quick overview of the programs, how LA Care really invested in in um, addressing the gap and the physician shortage. So. Uh, first of all, William Alamo, I'm a program manager, and I've been uh, working uh, with the team uh, that has launched the initiative for a few months now. I, I took so, uh, the, the, a bit of time off uh, to uh, take on other responsibilities, but earlier this year, I, I re, uh, rejoined the team. And so there, there are a few things that I wanted to share with you today about what this initiative is, is meant to accomplish. So this initiative was launched in 2018 as an investment by our Board of Governors who uh, understood that as a health plan, we really needed to commit to addressing the workforce sh uh, shortage uh, because th th those that were suffering were really our, our, our members, you know, the Medi-Cal member population that relies on the federally qualified health centers, on the community health centers that serve uh, communities like, like my own. And so LA Care was, um, was able to commit to a five-year plan, uh, $155 million invested uh, to address various gaps in the workforce, and so really at the top of the list is looking at uh, looking at how we could recruit, uh, train, and deploy a new wave of health professionals that uh, that were coming from the communities that we are serving as a health plan, and so that that was really at the top of the list for us. Uh, you know, as we started to look at different programs and different approaches. Uh, we wanted to also take um, uh, take an opportunity to look at how we could increase the supply and diversity of physicians that would also serve our Medi-Cal beneficiaries. So as a, as a health plan, we've really experienced uh, some uh, tremendous growth over the last four years since, since launching this initiative and the number, number of Medi-Cal members that we are serving as a health plan. And so I know that we have um, representatives from our provider network today. We have Watts. Uh, on the panel, and so that they're definitely a strong partner of ours in delivering high-quality services to the Medi-Cal populations. Uh, as a health plan, we we are assigned to serve seven, uh, nearly 70% of the Medi-Cal beneficiaries in LA County. So that's definitely a big big task and a big commitment from us as a health plan. And again, as I mentioned, uh, these members that are that are being served through the Medi-Cal uh, program are relying on, on those centers like Watts, uh, other community clinics, public hospitals uh, to access uh, services and, and to address the day-to-day healthcare needs. Um, and as we look at uh, what, what um, opportunities we had to address the gaps in the, work, in the workforce, uh, we definitely wanted to look at as early as possible in the workforce pipeline by also supporting the students that were uh, interested in pursuing health careers. And so we have a variety of programs that we'll review in a minute uh, that are also addressing uh, th those uh, gaps and opportunities early in the, in the pipeline. And then lastly here, the last bullet here on this slide is, is uh, highlighting also the investment that Elicare has made in community health workers and workers that are also able to support our members who are homebound. Uh, so these are many times um, uh, community members that take on a, a, a role where they can engage our, our members and also serve them 
uh, where they need us uh, to take care of them as well. So, uh, so let, let's go on to the next slide, Bridget, and um, and I can give you a quick overview of what the, the program outcomes have been to date. You see it, William. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so right. Yeah. So. So, uh, so I can give you a quick overview of the programs that are currently in the portfolio. So at the top of the list, uh, we have one of our scholars on the call today. Uh, so since launching in 2018, uh, we now have 32 scholars that have been awarded a full tuition scholarship uh, to attend their um, uh, school of preference, exactly. And uh, so we're very excited that the first cohort that was awarded in 2018 is set to graduate uh, next uh, next summer. And so. Uh, we've also seen that the students that were awarded are also taking on additional opportunities to uh, explore research uh, projects, uh, to uh, also uh, pursue a master's degree in public health or another uh, another emphasis. So I, I think the fact that we're, we're providing uh, such such an excellent opportunity here with the scholarship, I think it, it really frees up uh, the minds and, and it really reduces a lot of the stress that I think goes uh, with uh, accruing so much debt uh, over the years. So th this is an excellent uh, program that was part of the three core programs of the initiative. Uh, we also have the provider loan repayment program. And so with this program, we currently have 101 providers awarded uh, to date. And so providers are coming in with a wide range of educational debt uh, that we're hoping to alleviate uh, through this program. Uh, we have the provider recruitment program, which supports safety net employers, such as Watts, who are interested in recruiting new physicians that are that, that are committing uh, their careers to serving in the safety net, and and our our uh, request here is for them to commit to at least three years of practice in the safety net, and and many years more beyond that, of course. Uh, we have also the residency support program, which is uh, training uh, uh, physicians uh, that are uh, going into their their particular specialty. So we've partnered with several teaching institutions in LA County that have um, uh, that have a community focus and primary care focus program. And so through that investment, we've awarded uh, 38 uh, residency slots and four SC faculty combined. And so with this program, we've really looked at expanding uh, the number of slots available because we know that there are many students graduating, but they're not enough uh, residency slots to, to uh, really get the licensure. Uh, so uh, let's see, so we have a question here that, that we'll look at in a moment. Uh, for the CHW training, we have three cohorts of 54 CHWs trained so far, and these CHWs are serving our members today. Uh, they are uh, working in a, a variety of community-based settings where they can be part of multidisciplinary care teams and serve our members uh, at, through various programs. We have the in-home support services uh, training, which has trained nearly 4,000 workers that many times could be a family member that is seeking training to take care of their loved one. So again, this is an excellent investment that, that we that we see as as part of the portfolio. Uh, more recently, actually, this year uh, we've invested in a new graduate program through the Keck Graduate Institute that is focused on community medicine. So we're rewarding scholars that are part of the first and second cohort in, in that in that program. And so again, it's supporting their graduate education and also their pursuit of a, of a degree in medicine uh, through the medical National Medical Fellowship Program. We are uh, inviting fellows uh, that are in those uh, three disciplines. Uh, to come from different parts of the, the country uh, to get fellowship experience in our safety net. So they come for a period of six to eight weeks uh, over the summers and they get uh, training here in the safety net. So we hope that they can at some point return or stay here and, 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 and serve our members. Uh, we also are offering internship support for uh, youth that are either undergrads or entering a graduate program, but they're also interested in pursuing a career in health. And then lastly here, uh, one of the, the newest investments as well is the CDU New Medical Education Program investment where uh, we are supporting various components as they develop their program and hope to launch uh, in the summer of 2023 uh, to welcome the first uh, cohort of 60 new medical students, uh, which at that point will open the doors to welcoming 60 uh, new students every year. So this is separate from the partnership with uh, UCLA uh, where CDU and UCLA have a, a current program available. Uh, so it, it will definitely uh, more than double the, the capacity to host uh, medical students. And CDU has traditionally been a, a, a university, a college that has invited uh, students from underrepresented communities to, to pursue their, their careers in health. Um, so this is a summary of the programs currently in the portfolio. And if we can go to the next slide, I can give you an overview of what 
uh, uh, what we are seeing today in terms of the diversity and, and beneficiaries. So for the provider loan repayment program, uh, we have in the blue bars, we have uh, the, the, the makeup of our member population for, for Medi-Cal. And so we're seeing that uh, uh, for, the, for this slide, we're seeing that uh, although 40% um, uh, of our, our members are identifying with Hispanic or Latinx communities, uh, only 20% of our awardees are actually identifying with the same group for loan repayment, for the loan repayment program. So we have a lot of work to do here in, in the various categories where we're just not seeing enough um, uh, uh, recent graduates of color applying for our program. And so we're, we're looking very closely at where we can uh, fill in some of the gaps and, of course, increase the number of awardees from underrepresented communities. So if, if we look at the, the group here for uh, Black or African American uh, members, we have 11.5% of our members identifying with that group and only 8% of our applicants identifying with that same uh, same uh, racial and ethnic group. So again, th there's much work to do here and uh, really what we're seeing is that the benefit of this program where we can offer $180,000 in uh, loan repayment assistance over three years is, is really meant to uh, alleviate, again, that financial uh, financial burden that comes with um, uh, with you know attending a medical school and uh, you know and, and committing to practicing in a safety net setting. So uh, actually, in, in the next few months, we're preparing to also award a, a new uh, cohort of of, of uh, physicians under this program. So we have the capacity to award between thirty and sixty uh, sixty new um, uh, physicians. And of those that are currently in the wait list, a hundred percent of those are uh, identifying with underrepresented racial and ethnic groups in medicine. So we're very excited about the opportunity to expand access uh, to this type of support. And, um, and so, you know, th there's much work to do here, of course, but, you know, we're, we're making excellent progress with uh, our awards to date. Uh, and Bridget, if we can go to the next slide where we can review the language uh, capabilities of our awardees. So for this uh, slide, if you if you look at the uh, the last two uh, two rows here, 28 percent of our members are uh, listing uh, Spanish as their preferred language, and we're very uh, happy to see that 40 percent of our physician awardees are listing that capacity to be able to communicate with our members in Spanish. Uh, there are many uh, other languages listed here, and, and the language uh, list here uh, is actually uh, given to us by the state as a threshold. Medi-Cal languages that are most commonly uh, reported by Medi-Cal members. Uh, so, you know, really, um, we're, we're really seeing a good um, good result here in terms of the language capabilities that our physician awardees are coming with and that well, they'll be able to uh, to apply when they communicate with our members and deliver uh, healthcare services on a day-to-day. -day. And if we can go to the next slide, this is a slide where we will review uh, the medical school scholarship awardees and so this is really looking at, you know further back in the in the pipeline where um, uh, we, we have students that are currently in medical training and of the the 32 awardees that are currently in this scholarship program uh, 34 percent are uh, black or African American six percent are Asian six six percent white or Caucasian and 53 percent Hispanic or Latinx so what we've done uh, here is we've really uh, uh, worked closely with both UCLA and CDU to look at the pool of applicants that are uh, seeking uh, to, to receive at, um, uh, some type of uh, you know, a scholarship from us uh, through this program and really focusing on the stories that these students bring. Because uh, as, as I've reviewed uh, you know, so, some of the, uh, the reports that we receive on an annual basis from, uh, from these institutions, uh, we're really seeing that um, uh, students are coming from so you know so many different backgrounds, but really 50% of the students that are awarded to this pro uh, through this program are local students. So they are uh, born and raised in Los Angeles County. 25% uh, are uh, you know identifying their home outside of LA County, but in California. And uh, we have 22% uh, that have uh, that that actually were born outside of the U.S. But, uh, but we're raised in California. So it's, it's really um, great to see how, how um, the, the unique stories that these students bring to uh, this program really make it a, an excellent investment for LA Care. Uh, so again, we have students from the Central Valley, from LA County, San Diego, San Bernardino, uh, Riverside County. Uh, we have one student from Detroit, Michigan. 
Uh, and then we have students that were uh, that also uh, list their birthplace outside of the U.S. in Mexico, Nigeria, Lebanon, and Vietnam. Uh, so again, the students that are receiving admission into to these institutions have uh, amazing stories, and we're very uh, happy to to provide the support through the scholarship program as they uh, enter this uh, this field of, of medicine to eventually serve uh, our communities. And uh, Bridget, if we can go on to the next slide, William, we have. Two more minutes, William. Okay, two more minutes, all right. So this is again listing the capacity, language capacity of the students. And uh, well, again, we're very happy to see that 53% 50, of the students are listing Spanish as um, a language they can communicate with, uh, uh, with our members. And then uh, I think we'll close out with the next slide, Bridget, since we're running out of time. Uh, so over the next uh, few uh, few months, uh, we're looking at increasing uh, the reliability and, and the data that we're able to collect on our program so that we can uh, highlight the diversity of uh, beneficiaries, whether it's a student, physician, or other that is participating in our programs. Uh, we're also looking internally at what our provider uh, uh, data looks like uh, for our current provider network. Uh, we're going to continue to focus on recruitment, training, and retention of a uh, diverse workforce. And uh, over the next uh, three to six months, we're going, we're going to look at some preliminary data on all of our programs so that we can present it to our leaders and stakeholders and then make some recommendations on how we can sustain some of the funding for these programs. So uh, I think with that, I'll, we'll close out. And, um, and then I think, uh, Bridget, if you can guide us through some of the questions or, or Dr. Kyle, if there's anything pending. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, William. Uh, so that's... That's our program in a nutshell of what we're doing. We want to try to challenge other health plans to join us in this, uh, this work. Um, we are committed to this and we want others to commit themselves. Richard, you might have some questions now from our audience. We want to get those questions while our panelists are still with us before we close out today. Do you have any questions you think we should start addressing? You're on mute. There you go. Of course I was. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. Uh, we got quite a few questions in during today's panel. Um, so I'll start off with one, and you know, a lot of them had to do with pipeline programs specifically in Los Angeles, and really not knowing about them, hearing about them. And someone had a really interesting comment, you know, similar to the military, they are always recruiting in neighborhoods, but no one really sees doctor recruitments. Um, you know, people aren't seeing these programs getting advertised out in the community. So is there a better way for people to be doing this? Do these pipeline programs even exist in Los Angeles County? What are some thoughts there? All right, we'll open this up to the panel. Anybody want to tackle that? Great. Yeah, so, so I'll start off with the plug for CDU's uh, pipeline program. Like I said before, CDU has had a 30 year history of, uh, of supporting pipeline programs and for what people uh, who may not have heard of these before, you know, these are programs that identify people early on uh, to give them information, access, resources, and training to help prepare them for the next step. Uh, and so sometimes this can be in the form of summer programs. Sometimes they're Saturday programs. Sometimes they're after school programs. We have a whole cohort of them. We start at pre-K, go all the way through 12 for our pipeline program. So Bridget, I just sent you an email if you can put that in the chat or if there's a way you can distribute that to folks. Putting it uh, now. Great. Uh, so you can learn about the CDU pipeline program. Then uh, there are other pipeline programs that uh, occur uh, subsequently. Uh, Dr. Brooks and I were talking about when we were in college, there were summer programs that targeted a young minority uh, pre-medical students that could spend a summer getting skills, getting uh, access to, to information and developing mentorship relationships. Uh, after your training, uh, there's something called a post back program. At CDU, we have a, a post back program, which is for people who, after they've completed college, have, may decide, okay, well, I want to go to medical school. And you may not have wanted to actually apply while you're in college. Uh, you may have taken classes that didn't, uh, you know, meet the prerequisites, and you can come back and get those prerequisites filled. Or you can feel as if you need to have some more time to develop certain skill sets that will better prepare you to be successful in college. Post back programs are an opportunity to actually get those individuals prepared. Uh, and, and many times, uh, uh, you know, those programs can help us uh, as minority uh, mentors to get our, our folks, uh, you know, uh, prepared to get into these programs. So the pipeline 
uh, program, so to speak, has a wide variety, a wide range. You know, at CDU, we have them all. We have post pack we have summer programs, we have, you know, things that start in pre-K, where we have a mini white coat ceremony where the kindergartners get a little white coat at the end of the ceremony. And it's, <laughs> people cry. There's always tears. So, so with that being said, um, you know, uh, I feel that every academic medical center should have it. Um, uh, and, I, and I feel that, you know, if we could, you know, f find ways to to help those things spread, uh, we'd be more than happy to do so. All right. Can I make a quick different. comment? Because uh, I actually, honestly have to sign off. I think that these pipeline programs are critical to our success. And the numbers, because they're not there are not that many doctors in America, You, we can actually make a small dent by really um, utilizing these programs and getting more uh, African-American uh, men as doctors. I do want to say, however, the things we've talked about are relevant. It starts it from the beginning. So we, we need to get the information out, the concept of greatness, of excellence. And we all, everyone here needs to, you know, each one teach one. We, we all need to promote uh, science STEM programs uh, from the young, from the youngest to all the way through uh, and lend support. Uh, and and I thank LA Care for what they've done. We we have uh, docs from the provider recruitment program. So with that, I have to uh, get off. But I thank everyone here for their for their input. I thank LA Care, um, Dr. Kyle, and Mr. Bacchus, CEO. Uh, they they put their money where their mouth is. And the same thing with CDU, right? One point six miles away from me. Uh, the young man, uh, he's really excellent young man. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Burke, for being with us. Appreciate your time. My pleasure. Ihezele, you had something you wanted to say. Yeah, I wanted just to add on to Dr. Vargas's point. Um, I'm a beneficiary of a post -bac program. I actually attended a post -bac program uh, at Johns Hopkins where I actually got my master's as well. So um, I was you know, fortunate enough to be able to find a program that you know, was willing to give me multiple uh, benefits. Um, so definitely I encourage it. But I will say that like, um to whoever's point was that like yeah these programs don't go out and recruit they don't um but the honest truth is is that like they're easy to find if you just go looking for them and i think as people as doctors as medical professionals healthcare professionals we definitely have to like get better about advertising them because they are there they're there they're everywhere um when i decided to look for a post rank program i was amazed at how easy it was to find a bunch to choose from um, and just depending on what you are, are looking for. So, I mean, at all levels and all stages, honestly, they're there. Um, and if you talk to the right people, they can be affordable. Um, definitely. Um, it's something that I, I strongly encourage everybody to look into um, something that like really bolsters um, your understanding of medication, uh, medical education. Um, so I, they're definitely there. They just needed to be looked for. Um, that's the hardest part about it. But honestly, um, I think they're open. They're up for grabs for everybody. They're 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 looking for people. Definitely, um, they're very open to all candidates, um, all over the place. Especially here in California, we have a plethora uh, to choose from. Just even like right here in uh, LA, and I know uh, Charles Drew is one of the ones that are heading that. Um, I, I I can't tell you how much people I know that go to Charles Drew. So they're doing a wonderful job. Um, but it's definitely something that you have to go looking for. Um, and it's, it's, it's something that, you know, once you find it, I, I definitely feel like it's not hard to, to bridge that gap to getting in. So Lisa, you, you produce black doctors lists, and which allows people to find a black doctor if they're looking for one. You think that maybe putting some pipeline program information on your, on your site could be to be useful to this conversation? You already know I've been taking notes. I'm like, video <laughs> pipeline program now. I, I absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, in talking about the approach and on, on how to, um, you know, how to recruit more students, um, I really think uh, two would be the most beneficial one in which Dr. Bees is already doing, and that would be in partnering with the school district. I'm sorry, Dr. Bees. Um, you know, whenever we worked um, in, in the nonprofit I worked with and really in any of the community work we do, when you're trying to reach the students, you just have to go to where they are. So making partnerships with school districts has to be one of the strongest ways in order to make the impact is just going to where the students are. Don't force them to come to you and say, hey, I'm having a fair come to my health fair, go to them, you know, partner these programs with the school districts, because like Dr. Dees mentioned, it's all about capacity. And most of the time, the school districts may not have the capacity to create the programs. And then we have the programs, but don't have the enrollment that we need, right? So it's it's mutually beneficial. So 
partnering with school districts has to be one of the most important things. And the reason I bring that up too is in talking about, you know, what we spoke about in terms of standardized, standardized testing and the fact that our black students perform worse on standardized tests across the board um, and linking that then back to income. So if you just take income alone and say, okay, well, why is it that our students are underperforming on standardized tests? Then you can go to, well, if you have less income, then you probably live in a neighborhood that has schools that aren't as good as the, you know, education opportunities in neighborhoods that have more money, right? So if you just follow the, the, follow the money and follow where things going, then we know it, we need to elevate our education in any way possible and elevate the educational opportunities that are offered to our students in their schools. Um, so partnering with school districts is huge. And then another very like easy way to do it is make an athletic event. Don't feel, I, I say, you know, meet people where they, they are. I In my community work, you know, I don't want to say sadly, but this is just how it was. Whenever we had events that we needed to reach Black people, we made it a sports event and we got them there. And then once they're in the door, we got them there, right? We got them there and then we can have the right conversations and connect them with the right people and open their eyes to the other opportunities that are available for students. I don't think we need to, you know, talk down on the fact that that just is what it is right now. Eventually that'll change, but right now our students go towards athletic events. And if you want to reach those black male students, have a football, um, what did we do? A football clinic and then have all the other programs there so that they can then meet, oh, you're meeting athletes, but you're meeting doctors. And now I just met this, you know, black lawyer, you know, introduce them to all those things, just get them in the door. And I don't think we need to shy away from those opportunities as well. And it just happened to be that that's what worked. And so that's what we did. All right. Great. Thank you. Bridget, next question. All right. We got one here about community health workers and curious if community health workers are being utilized in that kind of community outreach to promote awareness and help educating the community in this crisis? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I, I think they certainly can be utilized in that, in that way. And we may not be taking full advantage of the opportunity that our community health workers um, can offer us. We have some at LA Care. Um, I'm sure Watts Health has them. Um, and so I think the answer is it certainly can happen and perhaps should be happening, and we just have to, we have to facilitate that to make it, make it become a reality. Just wanted to make a comment. Yeah. Um, not specifically community health workers, but we have been engaging community members in our medical school admissions process, and we train them, and some of them participate in the interviewing process. Now, once they do that, and they become integrated into our system, they are ambassadors for the medical school and the community as well. That's wonderful. Uh, yeah, and I'll just, yeah, and I'll just add to that. I think community health workers um, are an essential, uh, I think, liaison and link where uh, we don't have the, the agency and access oftentimes, uh, you know, at CDU, we have a community health worker academy uh, run by Dr. Hel Hector Balcazar and Dr. Sheba George. Uh, and actually, they're going to be presenting at noon today uh, at our CDU Haynes Lecture Series. So I'll send you that link as well if you guys want to learn about a community health worker academy at CDU. But uh, partnering with community health workers um, is, is something that, uh, in terms of interprofessional education, we really want our health professionals to understand uh, and respect and value. Uh, you know, we have a long history of community engagement. CDU was founded because of the community desire and need and, and really, uh, you know, uh, protest to say that we needed to have health services in South LA. So, uh, so this relationship with the community and community health workers uh, is, is essential. So I'll send you that information uh, as well. And as part of our new uh, medical education program uh, for which we plan to start in 2023, uh, there will be a community health worker experiential learning. Uh, program uh, for all incoming uh, students. That's part of our uh, our new curriculum. So I think community health workers uh, are, are essential, especially as we try to uh, fight disparities. All right, outstanding. Next, next question. 
All right, we got another one about pipeline programs and wondering if there are even enough to address the vast gaps at scale. And if there aren't, what can be done to increase these to levels where they meet the need? One of the things that the movie, um, the film showed uh, was a, a, a screen, a, a Chiron that basically said one in four black men now alive will be in prison in their lifetime. Just let that settle for just a second. It means that there is a 25% chance that any black man you know could spend some point in time in his life in prison. That number is probably not true for any other ethnic group on the planet. So this notion, I'm going back to this question of pipeline. Um, and we it, it, was, it was raised earlier, Besides these excellent pipeline programs we now have in medicine, are we still missing the mark? Are there more that we should be doing as a community? Are there people who are on our on this call with us today who represent community-based organizations? Is there something we want to ask them to do? Is there a call to action for our, our, our legislators, our, our, our mayor, or whoever, about how do we change the trajectory of life or this 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 group of men. Any thoughts? Lisa. I'm always raising my hand. Um <laughs> I think the first thing is um policy. You know, if you're talking about um one in four black men going to prison, it starts with the suspension and the expulsions and being sent out of class when they're in elementary school. So if we already know our teachers are targeting our black male students from then, then those are the same behaviors that are being perpetuated all throughout their life that leads them to prison. So you have to go all the way back there. And if we're talking policy and things that I can change on the most level. It's expansion, um, ex expulsion and suspension policies that are at our schools. You know, our schools should not be, you know, suspending a student for putting bunny ears up. That happened to my brother in elementary school. He put bunny ears up in front of a, a, you know, when they were taking a picture. The teacher sent him to the office and tried to get him suspended just for doing that, you know, putting bunny ears behind his friend. And my mom had to advocate for him and say, this is what kids do. He, he's not being violent. He's not being aggressive. He didn't even, this isn't even like, are you serious? You want to suspend my child for doing this? You know, so the, the type of, the way that our black male students are being treated, it has to be addressed from there. And if we're talking policy, it has to be just across the board. You can't suspend, expel, or send a student out of class. Let's just say student, even though we know this is for our black boys, but you can't send them out of class for these minor, minor occurrences, because that is what sets up their trajectory. If you're calling the police on them in elementary school, the police already, okay, now we know this kid. This kid's a troublemaker. We've identified him. And so now they're going to follow him for the rest of his life. You know, so these, you know, knowing the implications of what these things do, you know, just from the very, very start of their lives, that's going to impact, you know, the, the prison pipeline. I was saying I, I got to know my principal's office very well when I was in right. elementary school. Um, I, I, I lived through it, but um, that's back in the day of corporal punishment. Uh, Y'all don't know nothing about that, but that's when you, <laughs> the principal was the one who did the did the whooping, and so you had to go to his office. Um, teacher, for too busy, you know, teaching. Um, yes, sir. Dr. Roberts, that's all your hand. I just want to end my last comment out before I, uh, unfortunately, have to go, you know, med school duties are calling me. But um, I wanted to say, uh, I think uh, having Black people, uh, Black males, uh, particularly in leadership positions um, that make upstream changes um, is extremely important. I think um, that's a large part of what's influenced me to want to be a healthcare administrator. Um, I think it just goes without saying, if you don't have people in those spaces, when those decisions are being made that represent us, that no change is going to happen. I think that uh, I see it even at my level of uh, school now at UCLA, the way that they handle ethical issues is they come about with this roundabout 
uh, whether it's like a phrase or something, or let's say, let's do this, let's dedicate this month, or let's do these things that like really don't answer what the actual issue is. When it's like, yo, if you actually just came up to us, like we could tell you something that's a lot simpler. And it's actually crazy to realize like they spend money on some of these things. Like they spend monies on hiring a think tank to come up with a phrase that like is supposed to combat ethnicity issues. Like it's crazy. Like where it's like, you could have just put me in that. You could have gave me that money. I could have just give it out. And you know, like, I, there's so many other ways that, that those resources could be used. And so it's because we're not in the room and telling you that that's not what's going to appease us or that that's not going to solve the issues that we're battling that, you know, people are going to continue to come up with things that are just aren't relative. Sometimes like the efforts aren't being put out, but we need to make sure the efforts are directly allocated to where they need to be used. Uh, so to speak to Lisa's point, like you need to have you need to have people in those and for those type of that, that mentality being instilled and for those changes to be made for for that culture shift to happen that paradigm shift to happen you need black men is to be of influence to be in those rooms you, you need somebody uh that represents us um uh, particularly so i think a large uh issue is that we lack representation and the representation that we do have is very detrimental to our image i.e how many of us there's only 13 percent of us are african-american that take a uh, the population, but we're over, I believe, 40 to 50 percent of the uh, incarcerated population. Like that's our main image. That's what we're that's what that's how we are identified. So you that that starts to compound on every level when it's and it starts even at the youngest age. I was many a times in a principal's office. There's many principals I wish I could go back to and laugh at like right now. Like, what's <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> like, let's compare. But, you know, it's it's you know, I'm I, it, I'm happy to say that, you know, I'm I'm. I'm now being able to rise above that for people who did uh, stand up for me, for people who were in those positions um, that did take advantage of the influence that they had. So I think leadership is super important to any pipeline programs that we establish um, in order to maintain them um, and not just to have a, a, a transient moment or say just a select few in order to, to build a movement. You need to have leadership that sustains that. Um, so I think that's the like, one of the most missing factors that are harming black males everywhere is that we lack representation in key areas. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the playwright who did the move, the uh, play um, Hamilton, he had a line that said, you got to be in the room. And I just, I just want to thank all of you for being in the room with us today. I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank our staff, Marina, Bridget, uh, William, for, for staffing this, this day. It has been a wonderful conversation. I wish we had more time to, to go deeper. But each of our panelists, uh, Ihezele, uh, Dr. Dees, uh, Dr. Vargas, um, and those who've already had to sign off uh, uh, on our panel, thank you so much for coming. And thank you for being a part of us. I want to also thank the American Medical Association for providing us this uh, video. Um, if you have issues, um, you should have got an invitation to if you've already seen the video to share it if not you can write to our office and we'll try to give you some instructions but we we did actually have to rent the video for a four-day period to be able to show it to everybody um thank you so much have a wonderful day and 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 take this as a call to action that we're going to do more about this pipeline do more about opening windows and doors for people to come through and if we have can't open the door we'll just knock down the walls open these avenues for Black men to gain access to, to healthcare as well as to medical education, um, because that is going to change hopefully all of our futures. Thank you so much. Have a great day. <laughs>